This Week in Startups is brought to you by Miro. Working remotely doesn't mean you need to feel disconnected from your team. Miro is an online whiteboard that brings teams together anytime, anywhere. Go to Miro.com slash twist to sign up for a free account with unlimited team members. Twilio runs an amazing program for startups that includes a $500 getting started credit, access to webinars made exclusive for startups, and full support via their Twilio startups team. Sign up now at twiliostartups.com slash twist and Zendesk. Qualifying startups can join the Zendesk for Startups program and get six free months of Zendesk products. You'll also get access to an exclusive community of startups for advice and connections. Visit Zendesk.com slash twist today to get started. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups, the podcast where we talk about investing in, creating, and otherwise uh, helping nurture startups grow. And it's been a heck of a year, 2020. We had this insane pandemic, and then we had the murder of George Floyd and the protests that um, uh, followed. And now here we are in the summer of 2020, or just about to get into it. Uh, and we're wondering what the world's going to be like. Well, in the last couple of years, I've gotten to meet a really interesting person. Uh, she's just like me, except she's black, a woman, and a lesbian. But other than that, we have the same purpose in life, Arlen. We like to support founders and invest in them. And welcome back to This Week in Startups, your second appearance. Hey, thanks for having me, Jason. How are you doing under quarantine? How has it affected you? Uh, just uh, we'll start with the personal basis and then go on to, you know, on a business basis. Yeah, quarantine, I I'm following it to a T. Before, even before coronavirus uh, uh, started being a thing, I... I was fist bumping. I would not shake hands and people laughed at me for two and a half years. They <laughs> thought I was really weird, but I said, I'm not shaking your hand. Um, Same here. Yeah. Fist bump all the way. Stickler for it. So um, it's been, it's been okay. I mean, I've thankfully been quarantined with my wife and she's very entertaining and interesting and we, we never tire of each other's company. So that makes it really, really nice. And also we are really good about boundaries and space. Oh, and like good. we're in two different lanes and, and careers and it's just all of that works really well. Um, I have to say, though, I am it, it finally after almost four months, um, I am finally getting to the point where I'm like, I got to figure out how to get out of here. <laughs> like yeah. I got to do something. I don't know what that is safely, but some sort of thing. So we'll see. It, it seems like. Uh, oh, and by the way, congratulations. I, you are recently married, right? In the last year? Of, um, last August, tw 2019 August. Congratulations. Uh, Thank that's you. Awesome. It, it does seem like being outside is low risk now, they've determined. Uh, social distancing walks. So I have played tennis with two individuals. I've gotten tested twice myself. Uh, our kids are back in camp as of this week, uh, but they're doing pods. So only 10 kids per pod. All families are agreeing that they're in basic quarantine and, and you know, agreeing on certain measures. So that's been amazing the first week back. And I can see the change in the kids immediately. Like they're happy again. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, it's just so much better. Ugh. So thank God that's happened. How are you doing business wise? Because I know, uh, like myself, we do a lot of speaking gigs. Uh, we get paid for those. That's a part of the revenue stream. And then I know you talked about on your pod, uh, your first million, correct? Is the pod? That's right. Your first million. I know there's another one about your first million or something, and I, but I don't know who does the other there one. There is a your first million, but he started like two weeks after mine. I know. I saw that, and I was like, "Wait, you named your podcast after Arlen's?" And they were like, "No, <laughs> no, no. It's kind of a misunderstanding." Anyway, type in your first million. Arlen's podcast is great, by the way. Um, I listen to your podcast. Thank uh, you. Religiously, yeah, you, you really do. You don't just say that because you do write to me, and and you'll tell me if you liked a certain thing that's deep yeah. into a an episode. So that's real. That's the real deal stuff. It's real. Well, you know what? I have like an overcast. I it, I have all my subscriptions. And what I'll do is at the end of the night, I'll be working or working out. I just hit play at the start of the playlist, like an RSS reader. And then all of a sudden I hear your voice. And you know what I like about what you're doing and that I was going to crib um, is these like in between solo episodes you do where you just have feelings uh, mm -hmm. or <laughs> something comes on your mind and you say, I just have some feels and I got to just get it out. 
Uh, and you have one where you, you know, during this whole, um, uh, the protests, I guess, uh, yeah, you were, you were, it was pretty raw, you know, and I, I always appreciate that about you that you'll just sort of say it like it is. I, I'm curious, since you and I have always been very candid with each other, we, we, we have real talk on this program and I, I really enjoy that because a lot of people don't like to talk about race, you know, especially when it's, when you're different than each other, right? It's a hard thing for people to talk about these days on Twitter, but you and I always have productive discussions. So I was curious, I wanted to ask you a question that I'll just cut to the chase. You know, you got rejected a lot. You talk about it in your new book. It's about damn time, which uh, I have just started listening to. Um, and it's great, by the way. Uh, really, Thank you. You, you do a great job. Also, um, I don't know if you stop talking. Do you, you, you read the whole thing? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, because I'm only book. like two it's or three chapters me. in. And some people- No, it's on me. Yeah, it's on me. Some people yeah. read the first two chapters and stop. And, you know, you go through in the book, you know, exactly how hard it was for you to break in, but all your different techniques for breaking in. Um, but let's face it, like, not everybody wanted you in here. Not everybody gave you the support. And now we see all these yeah. protests, and Twitter is a virtue signaling- like machine with all these white VCs, non, you know, underestimated founders. And I'm curious if your phone is ringing off the hook now where people are like, you know what, I should have backed you before and I kind of fucked that up and now I need to back you now. So have the le during these protests, you get all this white guilt and people saying, I got to make up for this. And, and they call you as the, the route to get to this deal flow. Yeah, it's happening. The things the last few weeks have been very, very interesting. Uh, I've been watching it unfold when it comes to people reaching out. Uh, a lot of scrambling going on. There's a That's lot what of I was scrambling. That was the on. word I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah, it's going on. There's also a lot of sincerity, um, in my opinion, come go, going on where some people who who have been in the past wanting to work with us but didn't have the power within their organizations to do so are now they have more leverage internally now to say look you you all have we have a problem i know where to go and that reaching out so there's it's a lot of that inbound and and, and sussing out what is um worth our time what is valuable what is worth the founder's time and what is not because I I just don't play the game of like holding out the buckets and just taking any money that will will fall. That is right. just not interesting to me. Um, the autonomy, I think you, you you talked about how we have a lot in common, uh, and I like to talk more about that too, if you don't mind too. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, but that autonomy is really important, and that integrity is really important to me and to our team. And so we are, we are highly protective of our company, the companies that we've invested in that have allowed us to invest in them. And we're highly protective of our, of our own, uh, brand and integrity and reputation, most importantly. And so, yeah, it's coming out of the woodworks, you know, people are just all of a sudden so woke. And so I'll, I'll, I yeah. knew it all the time and I felt this all the way. But every once in a while, you'd get something sincere that is worth taking a look at. You know, and e even at a cynical approach where it's like, oh my God, you, you know, it's so hard for people to say all black, uh, you know, black lives matter, right? And when I first heard the term black lives matter, I was like, well, everybody's life matters, right? Like, mm -hmm. that was my initial reaction too. And then because it's, and it's like a, I think a very interesting test to at what point you realize that all, when people say black lives matters, they're not saying all, they matter more than other lives, right. but that they have been, they have not mattered, and all we're asking for is to catch up and make them matter as the as much as anybody else's. I will freely admit, I had the same reaction, but to hold on to that reaction now, after you get through the mental exercise of saying, what is the person's point in saying Black Lives Matter? Oh, their point is not to exclude everybody else. It's to let you know that they're just trying to reach up to have it to, for parity, right? Yes, 100%. 100%. And people are getting there. And I think you could be cynical. One could be cynical. And I would understand you, especially being cynical about it, having, you know, knocked on doors and gotten turned away. But in another way, hey, late to the party, fine, but you're here. At least we have to, you know, um, get you on board so that maybe you will have a black partner in your, you know, partnership or you will syndicate a, a founder from a black deal, you know, who's a, a black founder, a person of color, an underestimated founder. Yeah, I'm I'm not here to 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 be anybody's savior to to kind of make them feel like they've caught up. I 
I'm definitely someone who you have to start, you start with a hundred with me. You have to lose points. You don't start at less than a hundred. You know what I mean? Like you have to, you, and so I, I'm a fair person and I'm a person who feels like, I feel like what are we fighting for? If not for us all figuring, getting it, getting it and working together at the same time, as Rihanna says, you know, don't mistake my kindness for weakness. There are, it, there is a difference between someone getting it and then really getting it and then saying, Oh, I've not got it before, but now I want to be part of this. And I'm going to go back to the people I know are working on it and talk to them. How do I help? And someone who is like, Oh, I don't want to look bad or I don't want to lose these other resources that are, are, um, dependent on me look uh, like being in this, in this field. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to claw my way or, you know, there's the, the group that's just doing these, these crumbs, these little, you know, it, it doesn't take anything for them to, 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 it falls out of their pockets as they're standing out of their car. You know, <laughs> to me, that's insulting. And it, it's not that I will never get to you. I, I agree with you and I like you and, and I think you're doing a good job, but it's just that a lot of them are not there yet. And that's okay to say too. Hey, everybody. We all know that working remotely is very different. And a lot of us are getting an education on going fully remote, fully work from home. And you've seen the headlines. Everybody is moving to work from home or remote first work. What this means is things like whiteboards and brainstorming sessions. Well, they're just not easy to do until now. With Miro, you can get to work with your team and you can do it collaboratively with this online whiteboard system. It's amazing. We started using it at launch and it is a game changer. You can have an infinite canvas, right? You can just keep adding to it and moving left and right and up and down, making mock-ups, organizing files, and managing complex projects. Their templates help you really get this done quickly, and you can start very easily. Just pop on one of these templates and you get to work. You can add your docs, you can add spreadsheets, and other important information directly into Miro. And that's M-I-R-O, but it's pronounced Miro. And you get in there and you can put in your Google Drive, Dropbox, Jira, Slack, and more. You can even do video chat with your coworkers without ever leaving Miro. That's super cool, right? And you're going to love this. You got to try it. Over 5 million users are using Miro and they trust it to help their teams work more efficiently. And here is my associate Presh. He's creating a whiteboard and he's doing all of our Angel University workshop brainstorming on it. Now, whenever we need to brainstorm, we can go into this whiteboard and say, hey, how do we make this better? And we can put ideas in there and different projects uh, and different efforts and make all those adjustments. Start collaborating for free when you sign up for an account at Miro.com slash twist. And it's going to be free. M-I-R-O dot com slash twist. That's M-I-R-O dot com slash twist to get a free account with unlimited team members. You're going to love it. It's beautiful and it's impactful and it's effortless. It's really just one of these no brainers. It's really great for brainstorming. Okay. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Yeah, you know, and I I do a lot of self-examination about this because I think that the leak I had in my game was I thought that because my experience was as an outsider, I had to break in, that I understood exactly, you know, how to do it. Therefore, I thought everybody could do it. And, you know, my wife sat me down uh, when, when I wrote my book. And her friend, Lisa Randall, um, who is a famous physicist from Harvard, they said, you know, you wrote here as you're such an outsider. Are you really like that much of an outsider? I was like, yeah, kid from Brooklyn, mom's a nurse, dad's a bartender. I'm the outsider's outsider. They're like, what about the person with a single parent? Did they have it harder than you? I was like, well, of course. And okay, what about the black lesbian from the South with a single parent, right? And then I met you, right? And I was like, ah, shit. I'm not as much of an outsider as Arlen is. Yeah. And you had to work harder than me. Even though my experience might have been that I work really hard to get here. Yes. It's undeniable you had to work twice as hard, 10 times as hard. Yes. And the thing, so what you're doing right now, Jason, is is such a, is, I'm not going to throw you a parade, but it really is such a breakthrough compared to what you might have said two years ago. You know what I mean? It really is. And to me, it's, it's where I want people to, to, to find their way. We don't know what else, you know, there is left to, to figure out, but that is so key because so many people, I'll, I'll speak on a stage and, or I'll, I'll write something and somebody will pull me to the side, either in person or online. And they'll say, I'm a straight white man and I didn't come from money. 
I didn't go to the Ivy League school and you're just putting us all in one bucket and saying that they're we're wrong and you're right. And I'm like, I'm not saying that. In fact, I've made every every ch- trance I've had, I've said affluent wh- white man. Every chance on top of that, I've said not all affluent white man. You know, everybody, I'm going to be the first person to 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 protect everyone's rights uh, for themselves, right? But it's almost like saying like, is it taking any of my privilege away to say that, yeah, it's harder for someone in a wheelchair to get on a plane? Does that mean that I didn't earn my way onto that plane? I didn't pay for the ticket and I didn't, it wasn't, you know, I didn't get out of breath when I walked. It just means it's a simple fact that it was harder. <laughs> and then you have more power in that. And you could say, well, what can I do as someone who's not in a wheelchair to make it easier? Can I speak up and make sure that they get heard? Yep. Cool. So we're all on board. Yeah, you know, and it takes talking to each other and talking this through because I think as a white person, uh, you are constantly on guard to be like, I, I'm not racist, right? I, did I do anything racist in my life? Did I say, did I tell an inappropriate joke at some point? Did somebody else tell an inappropriate joke and I was there? I can tell you I was in the room when people were making inappropriate jokes and I didn't say anything in the 80s and 90s because I was up and coming. I don't want to be, you know with my bosses and they say some inappropriate joke about a Mexican or an African American and, and I get fired because I stopped them and say that's racist bullshit, even though I knew it was happening because I was 20 years old. And I was like, what do I do? Right. And it's you you spend this time on being defensive and concerned. Am I am I a racist? Did I think racist things? Uh have I told a racist joke? Have I have I been in the room where somebody told a racist joke? And I think it you're constantly in your own head trying to do that. And you, you have to have empathy for the other person, just like you have empathy for the person in the wheelchair and their experience. And you take a little moment and say, yeah, you know, that must be hard. But there could also be somebody who's, you know, in a wheelchair and they didn't have a hard time getting into Harvard because their parents are a legacy and they gave a million dollar building. A hundred percent. They may have a privilege over me when it comes to a topic, when it comes to a job they have. It's just the point. The point of it all is that recognizing and, and saying a, a, a privilege in a room is not is not putting the person put, putting someone down. It's like saying you are six foot tall, you are five foot tall. That's it's just the color of your eye. It's the it's the, the how much you can bench press. It's literally a fact. It's just like something we can all agree on. Oh, yeah, you know, in, in this country, I guess, you know, with the 400 years of history we have, a black person might have had a harder time getting the same uh, resources that I got. Doesn't mean I'm, you've worked any less hard in your own life and, and, and competed. Um, and it, but it, and it doesn't take away from that. It just means you're accepting and you're, you're, you're like saying, yeah, you're recognizing, man, that must have been hard. Cause I know how hard it was for me, man. How, how hard was it for you? That makes all the difference in the world because then you're like on level playing field. You're like both uh, eye to eye. And then you can just kind of go, okay, let's see what we can do. Are we competing with each other? Are we working together? Either way, let's go. At the end of the day, what we think, I think we want as a species, as Americans is, we we don't want everybody to have essentially the same outcome. We want everybody to have the same opportunity, right? Like 100. You might have better results than me. I might have better results than some other investor. But we just want to at least have the ability that we could all start a fund and be treated the same when we the met same. with LPs, right? Like, you know what, Jason? What I would love to be able to do and what most founders, black founders and other founders would love to be able to do is just to simply wake up and start working on their thing. And not have to spend 80% of my time talking about how I'm black and I'm gay and I'm a woman and defending myself and doing this. And, 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 you know, I was talking to someone uh, a little earlier and I, we were talking about numbers and over a, uh, however, seven year period or something, I raised like seven million dollars, six or seven million dollars, right? 25K, 50K at a time. That's a lot, but it's a drop in the bucket. So. If you think about the last five years, this experiment of backstage capital has been the, the same amount of money that it goes into many like low ball series A's or high C's. In total. In total. Right. So as much progress, it's still a drop in the bucket in some ways. Yeah, but it and you know, but so much has has happened because of it. So it's it, it's it's really interesting to, to like 
It's also interesting, though, to see how nervous people get. People in power are getting, because you said earlier, some people didn't want me to be in this. Some people don't want me to be in it today. It's I really funny. I think that's funny. why you and I, I consider us like friends on a level, even though we don't hang, I feel like we have a certain camaraderie because people didn't want me in the industry either because I didn't come to go to Stanford and I, I'm not a developer and I'm not like particularly, you know, I'm a little cantankerous, sharp elbowed and opinionated. Might sound familiar. I think what what it came down to with you is that I had to listen to a lot of your interviews to kind of read between the lines uh, beyond your persona. Right. Because um, a lot of our early conflict was in, you know, your your reactions or your sa- statements of things. And I would be like, I would just take it at face value and think, you can't be serious. You're saying that you're going to lower your standards to let women in? Like what? Right. But what if you if you actually like watch an hour of you talking, it is simply it's it's a, there's an earnestness there, there's a sincerity there, and as soon as someone tells you no, that's not what we meant, you're like oh well, let me investigate that and learn. Can more and can more white men do that? Can more in, uh, so-called genius investors or visionary investors? Can more of you all please do that and like investigate thing, uh, diversity inclusion the same way you invest, investigate cryptocurrency and aut- autonomous vehicles? And in fairness to you, that was the worst tweet I ever did because <laughs> <laughs> like right after I tweeted it, about 50 people were like, what? what? And I was like, oh, sorry. I, that's n- literally the exact opposite of the Ted. And to catch people up. Somebody was like, I'm not seeing enough. We're having the whole pipeline discussion, which I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts on the pipeline and if it's changed. Because it, it's I, in my objective experience is pipeline is changing in a major way. But pipeline as a word is a very triggering and loaded word. And we'll get into that. But I said, you know, the problem is a lot of these VCs have this like benchmark. I'll only meet with people when they hit a million in revenue. I'll only hit them when they two million in revenue. And I said, you know, you're going to have to lower that bar to when you're willing to take that meeting. And they were like, are you saying lower the bar for black people? And I was like, yeah, I was uh, I was leading that charge, Jason. I, I know. I, had to, I was just like, oh, my God. I lit the torch. 140 <laughs> characters is not getting it done. And I was like, it was no, a, no, no, it no, was no, a, no. It was, a mis- it was an unfortunate choice of words for sure. Yeah, um, but no, it, sure. it, did, it did take um, a few, you know, me looking at a few things and just eventually I just started forgetting about, I'm like, I started peeling away from all that and saying, okay, yeah, we, you, we really do have the same philosophy on, on investing. We really do. And I, in fact, I even think that I'm going to end up mimicking a lot of your pattern. Uh, I'm just about five or six years after you. Twilio is the cloud communications platform that's used by Uber, Airbnb, Shopify, and so many more, including Inside.com. I use it in the launch. And they're partnering with This Week in Startups to bring their Twilio and SendGrid startup programs to our listeners. Yes, they really care about startups. They want to get in early with you and support you. And boy, when I tell you the call to action on this one, you're going to fall out of your seat. Twilio, you know, provides you the building blocks to add messaging, voice, and video to your web and mobile applications. You just drop in that code snippet. You all know how to use it. And boom, you're off to the races. They are rooted in startup culture, and they are here to help you on your journey. In fact, Twilio's first product roadmap was written on the back of a pizza box back in 2007. Twilio gives you the power to build communication apps easily so you can spend more time focusing on what counts, like hiring and your customers. Engage and delight your users while scaling globally, all from one API-powered platform. You can do SMS, you can do voice, you can do WhatsApp, you all know how it works. And now with their acquisition of SendGrid, email all in the same platform. So here is the amazing call to action. Twilio's startup program is second to none. You get a $500 get started credit, you get access to webinars made exclusively for startups, and you get support from the Twilio startups team. Plus, wait for it, you get $3,000 in Sangri credits. That's $3,500 if you go right now to sign up at twiliostartups.com slash twist. twiliostartups.com slash twist. That's twiliostartups.com slash twist. Thanks again to Twilio for supporting founders with the $3,500 offer. Well done, Twilio. Well, it, I agree with that because I've been watching like a hawk what you're doing with your backstage syndicate. Is it backstage syndicate.com or? It's backstage crowd.com. Backstage crowd.com. Right. Because you're anticipating 
non-accredited investors. And you and I had a great talk, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago when you were getting ready to launch your syndicate or relaunch it. So explain to people what you're doing, uh, and then we can yeah. get into sort of the best practices around that, and uh, we can circle back around race issues, et cetera. Sure. But- so we, we've we done everything, you know, at Backstage. We've tried everything. We've had multiple, multiple large investors promise the world and then back out and all of that. And As LPs in your fund. No, well, not in our, the ones who are in our fund have followed through, you know, but there have been many outside of our fund who have promised the world and just backed out last minute or whatever. And that's a whole other story. But it's been, it's been pushing a boulder up a mountain for, for however many years, right? And on top of that, we've, and in spite of that, we've been able to invest in more than a hundred companies. We have now several of the, you know, a pre-seed mostly, usually 25K to 100K, starting off with small checks but really making a huge impact on this ecosystem. And now you're starting to see it finally see some of that, you know, come to bear where you have these series A uh, deals, you have people behind the scenes with these stealth companies that are going to come out and just blow everybody away. You have that. And with the current climate with everything, I am I'm just I've reached a point where I don't want to be beholden to these larger institutions. Now they're they're invited to to participate. They're invited to come back and 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 we can talk about it. But right now, what I want to do is go to the people who I talk to every day and backstage talks to every day, who are these operators who are you know, some of them are founders themselves. Some of them work at these major tech companies and they make two hundred fifty k a year or whatever. And they just want to be part of something. So you know this very well, and I'm sure your listeners do too. The syndicate is a very interesting um, way of pulling those pull, pulling those resources together, like-minded people, and offering them some di- some really interesting deals. And yes, diverse diverse led companies, but that's even a bonus, and some really great negotiation terms, negotiated terms that I've been able to do, and let them come in with us. So if we're going to put in 100k or 250k, well, actually. Here's the real cool part. Like we have been putting in 25k to 100k, and 100k was only last year when we started our uh, accelerator in four cities and two countries. Okay, we were, we're moving, but those are still small checks. Now we can put in 250k, 500k, Major maybe investor. a million. Yes, like Board we seat. can. We can change the whole narrative for our backstage, and we can yep. continue the work we're doing, but have a bigger punch, pack a bigger punch right. with the syndicate. And so we're doing that uh, back at backstage crowd, and we have we have it's about half half. So half the people who sign up are accredited, and half are not. And we have today about twelve hundred people signed up. Fantastic. So yeah, it's it's exciting, and our, we have our first two deals out there right now, heard, and it's I just. Heard. I gotta, I, I'm not signed up. Stuff. I didn't get the deal memo. I gotta get the deal memo. I gotta sign up. Yeah, you gotta sign up. It's good stuff. It's really good stuff. What's really good is, and you're right, we did, you you are like, but five years behind me. It's like year five, I, I did start doing the syndicates. I think 2014, and I started angel investing in 2009. And I was doing the 25, 50K C checks. And in fact, when I had my first little fund, um, I put 50K into Calm and 328,000 came from the syndicate. That was the first syndicate I ever did. I saw that. I saw that. That Calm deal is a great case study for what what is going on here because now what are they? I don't even know. They're 1.4 like, billion. Yeah, just a little bit, right? Yeah, and we were $5 million around. We own 5% of the company. I and think. I saw the interview you did when you when you, when you you kicked that off. I just saw that recently. Oh, you, you watched the old off. one where I had Alex yeah. on and I offered him 25K in the program. Yes. That's a, I it's a good that. strategy. Use the pod to get the deal flow. Yeah, it works. Yeah, and we have, let me tell you, we have monster deal flow. Monster deal flow. Well, I, I, the thing I've noticed about underestimated founders, aka underrepresented founders, aka black, brown, uh, Latinx. Women. women. Is it Latinx? Is that the right term now? Am I yeah, Latinx. The, so that we consider that term? brown, Latinx, and LGBTQ as well. That's what yeah. we invest in as a mandate. Yeah, and- if you look at those groups, the valuations will be lower for higher performance. Well, that might have been true a few years ago. And I, and, I, and I understand what you're saying. I just want to be very clear. I'm not saying it should be that way, but I think I they know, are still underestimated. The valuation itself might be back to almost... Parity. But the Here's the thing. It's not the valuation. It's, it's where they are. Let me see. How do I put this? Because if you say that just directly, if somebody were to take that sentence out... Yeah. They may say, okay, well, they're just not as good a company. Right. We're talking about 
amazing companies. We're talking about, um, I want to give an example because I think it'll be helpful. Can I, can I do that? Yeah, unpack. Okay. So I'll give an example, uh, and I'll try to do it blindly because it's, I can't say too much about it, but okay. there is a company that, um, that is doing, uh, it's a telecom company. And so they have satellites that they're putting together, that they put together. The black male founder, and you may recognize this, but the black male founder 16 years ago developed a technology that lets the satellites go into space or lets objects go into space for longer because it, the, 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 the technology cools the objects faster, right? And for longer. So he sold that to a major company. 10 years later, and then a few years later started this current company that we're invested in in 2017. And he used, he uses the same technology that he built and, and invented 16 years ago, sold to a major company, uses that same technology now for the telecom company to send in satellites. The same, and I know you're friends with Elon Musk, and, and I think this founder drives a Tesla, so there's, there's no, you know, there's love there. Yeah. But the same 12,000 uh, satellites that it takes Starlink. Starlinks to put into orbit, 12,000 in this constellation, they can do for 12 satellites, 12, oh. and have more coverage. So all of that is to say, and, and they're, and they're um, backed by three major funds. We were, there, we were in before those funds. Right. And they're going to most likely uh, be a nine-figure uh, valuation next yeah, year. Yeah. And it, so- Given that, and you have that early relationship, when you go to them and say, hey, you got another round, I know you're oversubscribed or, you know, it's going to be tight, can backstage get an allocation, they're going to, for 250 or 500, they're like, well, you gave me 25 when I needed it. 100%. You, you don't get boxed out of deals, which is exactly the experience I've had over the last 10 years, which is, you know, if you're the first check-in or early check-in, the founder's always got real love for you and a special place. I just think, uh, you know, the Still to this day, I see companies with less performance get higher valuations or the same valuation than an underrepresented founder with more performance. And that, to me, yeah. a, a cynical way to look at it would be arbitrage. But, you know, like you, you literally invest in two female companies for the price of a male company with the same performance. Just to be real, I can tell you, I objectively see that not universally, but I see it often. And it's bizarre then to I would me. have to just argue, what I would argue there is, uh, what you're saying is not wrong. It's not inaccurate. Right. But well, the way I would say it is because you have to understand 60%, 70% of your audience is going to hear that. Yep. And automatically, just because of an unconscious bias is going to think means that means that those women have a worst case thing. So instead, we say those two women, their companies are properly priced. And the other people are being overvalued. Overvalued. I like that. I like the framing and because that of means that. that you're paying sure. too much and you're throwing money away. You like it. I like it. I like the framing. Um, we and you know the thing you the, also the great advantage you have now is now that you've built this brand. Um, I would suppose in year five of investing, you're you you probably have a similar experience to what I have, which is instead of chasing and looking for deals, going out and hunting. You become a sorter of deals. People just email you all the best deals, and you're on the top of the list. If you're an underrepresented founder, well, of course you want Arlen's money. Of course you want that checkbox because she knows the space and she's going to help validate what you're doing. So, is your life chasing deals now or sorting through them as they come in? I would. I if I didn't want to, I would never have to go seek source a deal for the rest of my life. At this point, just crazy. It's, we have insane deal flow. And we have deal flow. We have people who pitch us who are white men hmm. who are doing well because well, they think they can convince us to like, <laughs> you know, change our minds for a second. Um, no, our deal flow is, is, is out of this world. And it's also, it's quantity and quality, you know? So it's, uh, we do a lot of, I think a lot of that is in the work that we do with the 98% that we don't invest in because that builds up a certain character and a certain reputation and and it's a lot of work especially when you're under um you're under resourced like we are but it's so worth it in the long run well in in a way when you think about it it makes sense although a lot of investors miss what you just said which is 
your def your your reputation is defined by the people you say no to more than the people you say yes to. The people you say yes to, of course, love you. You gave them money, you supported them, you validated them, and you went on the journey with them. The people you say no to, well, they're hurt, right? You, oh, I didn't make the cut. But if you're kind to them and supportive of them, then they go out and say, you know what? It wasn't a fit for Arlen or Jason, but we did. You know, uh, they they were particularly helpful in these ways. Hey, everybody, I'm going to start with the call to action here. Zendesk is giving startups six months of Zendesk for free. You heard that right. If you've got under 50 employees, you can go right now to Zendesk.com slash twist, and they will give you six months free because they know it's crazy out there right now. Everybody is dealing with a lot of issues in their startup, in the world, with the pandemic, et cetera, and they want to help support startups. And I've known Zendesk for a decade. They are amazing human beings. They make a terrific product, as you know, and they are tremendously supportive of startups. So again, six months free for your startup, and they qualify startup as under 50, which they probably could have said under 25, but I think they're being super generous right now and they want to be supportive. Zendesk is a service-first CRM company with support, sales, and customer engagement products designed to improve customer relationships. You know all this. The Zendesk for Startups program is offering qualified companies, again, six months free, and you can utilize their support and sales solutions and gain access to exclusive startup community uh, resources to help you scale out your customer support. And customer support... You know, it went from an afterthought now to being one of the most important things you do in your startup. Yeah, sure. Everybody thinks you got to build a product. Everybody thinks you got to have a great sales team out there getting people into the top of the funnel. You know what you really need to do? You need to not have a leaky bucket and have people churn and leave your startup because nobody picked up the phone. Nobody solved their problem. Nobody did proper training, right? If you're the CEO, you need to hang with the customer support team, with the customer success team, and you need to be looking at the Zendesk tickets because that's when you're gonna get great inspiration for new features and products or things you need to fix that you didn't even know about. So if you're an early stage startup defined as under 50 employees, get started today with six months free. That's worth thousands of dollars. Go ahead and get to Zendesk.com slash twist. So how do you try to be helpful with the no's and the 98%? We have, we built a lot of content. Um, that's one of the reasons we kind of see my face everywhere, but it really is to bring people in to understand that we have these podcasts. We have, um, online courses. We have free and paid. We have, uh, uh, meetups all the time. We have, we do investor weeks with our portfolio and outside of our portfolio. We do all sorts of, uh, ad hoc connecting all day long, very collaborative. And, um, and then we have office hours, like our office hours. Are, st are for people to kind of learn about us. And these are things that we literally, like we really don't have to do, not to, we, sh we don't get a parade either. <laughs> like don't, don't send us a parade. We really, literally don't have to do, but Here's it your is, cookie. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's almost like we understand how valuable those companies are. Right. Even if we couldn't invest or we didn't invest, we understand how valuable they are. So we will, like with our accelerator, 2019, we got 1900 applications in a five week period. We chose 24 to give 100,000 to over four cities and two countries. Okay, we did all of that in a three or four year program. We put it into nine months, like building it. It's an insane amount of work. The top 100, we put into a Slack group yeah. and said, you know, there's just no way to tell, to express to you how difficult this decision was, right. but we want you to keep talking to each other. And there's so, and we do our mixtape, our newsletter that I encourage everybody to um, sign up to at backstagecapital.com. So many people get grants and uh, all sorts. They meet co-founders and they do this and that. A lot of a lot of what we're doing. So we we overlap a lot. Like you, you know, you have launch and you have mm -hmm. your summits and you have your accelerator and we have yep. our stuff. So there's a lot of overlap because you understand that by doing well, by doing good to other people by other people. Yeah, you're also kind of making sure that you are still seeing those outlier deals. That's what it's all about. You know, like the more, the reason I wrote my book was, and, and you, you did the same thing in yours, which was, hey, listen, I, I figured it out, like how to get here. Here's the roadmap, because by the way, I'm here already. Like getting to here, I already did. So me telling you how to get here and get in the room, eh, that doesn't, keep, doesn't kick me out of the room. And, and then if you actually figure it out and you get here, well, you'd be like, oh, wow, that's kind of dope. Jason got, helped me get to the room. He helped me get my deals. And, 
you were incredibly generous on your last two or three podcasts talking about the syndicate of, hey, you know, Paige Craig has been helpful, Jason's been helpful, and the book's good, except, you know, you might need mine as a palate cleanser. You might need it as a palate cleanser. I, I said, I said to, I said in that, that you, two years ago, when, three years ago, when the book came out, there are certain things I think you would not say today. Go ahead. Like there are me. times where you said, you kind of, you really talked about, uh, you leaned in that, that this was male kind of oriented. You also leaned in that, Silicon Valley had to be the place you started. There's no other way to do it. I just don't know if that's true today. Well, it's definitely not true after the pandemic. That's for sure. Yeah. Before it, you know, I, that chapter five was meant to be a little cheeky, but I said, you know, hey, do you, ha in order to be a, gr you know, a great angel investor, you need to be in Silicon Valley. I said, yes. And then I explained the next chapter because this is where the deal flow all goes through, right? Like everything routes through here. Even if it's not based here, it routes through here at some point. The founders come in and raise money. Now that's, I think that's off the table given the pandemic. Like, I don't know. I think that. it was before. I just, really? that's just my opinion. Yeah. Th two thirds of our companies are outside of, of Silicon Valley land, um, on purpose. And a lot of them are doing even better. Oh, no, than I agree with others. that. I'm talking about where the investors are. So to be a great investor, like to miss the deal flow here means you miss the outlier traditionally, right? The, the history shows the biggest outliers have been here. Now that's changing. Sweden's had a bunch of outliers. Uh, Australia. What about got Atlanta? Two or three. Like Atlanta is fire. A couple, right now. yeah, yeah. It's on fire. A couple, it's a couple. I'm talking about like ten billion dollar companies, but they haven't go, had that go yet. To, have go to Atlanta, hang ones. out for a couple weeks. Go to Atlanta, and like set it up. Well, bubbling it. up, yes. I'm talking about the one billion dollar exit mark, right? Like that's the hard one. But we're starting to see that happen now. It's happening. You know. I'm telling you, you're already missing it. It's in Atlanta. It's uh, in Atlanta. <laughs> and then it'll be in Dallas, and then it'll be in Philadelphia. Uh, if you see a great deal. And it's a cis white guy. I'm not saying like a Greek kid from Brooklyn or something. <laughs> would, you, would you consider in the next couple of years uh, syndicating an un, a non-underestimated founder if it was like a great deal and you just thought this, or are you going to stick to the mission and just say, that's it, we're just under- It's not, it's not even a mission, man. Like, you understand. <laughs> you understand. Okay, let me see if I can do a quick analogy. Go. If you were just the, if you were just, you just had the best deal flow of your life when it came to, um, uh, any, anybody in Silicon Valley, cause we'll take it back there. We'll do right. two things, two birds, one stone. Sure. Anybody in Silicon Valley that was in five mile radius of you, you just had everybody picked up the phone and called you, which probably happens anyway. You just had that. And then I said to you, and this is going to be count, the people are going to be confused by my, this analogy, but, and then I said to you, there, there is, uh, just to, you know, I'm gonna do it opposite. Let's say you were only, you were just only, only, only doing cloud, cloud deals. Right. You're doing cloud deals all day. And someone said, man, I got this great real estate over here. Yeah. Yeah. Great real estate. You don't understand this real estate is going to 3X in a year. Yeah. This is a 10X in two years. You, you might, you know, throw a little pebble at it. You might say, ah, oh, I'll see what happens, but you're right. not going to put everything into that. Right. You're going to, you're going to become, you're going to dominate in cloud. Right. I don't, I don't, I get requests from white men to invest. There's a couple of times in the last 12 months where I've asked a couple of white men, can I put in 5,000 or 10,000 personally? And I do that because it, it, it absolutely, that money is in a certain account that any money I make, I invest in other people. So I, I say that, but I've invested in 130 plus companies. I've looked at 6,000 that were by underrepresented, underestimated founders. I've been asked every day of my life almost to invest everywhere else. And I have the discipline to say, no, I am so bullish on us. I, like I couldn't, it. I couldn't be more. Well, I always tell people, if you have an advantage too, like you have to press the advantage you have. And so for you to close a deal with an underrepresented founder would take you half as long as anybody else, right? They yeah. want you on the cap table, right? Yeah. And that's, people don't understand how different that is um from buying public equities anybody can buy a share of netflix but imagine if you know the ceo of netflix was like well who are you and why do you want to buy shares in my company and, and can i get some references right that's the world we live in which is you know your reputation matters in getting you on that cap team. yeah because i'm sure when you were when you were st like hit had those couple of hits at first yeah I'm sure you had a lot of uh, distraction where people were like, why don't you put your money in this? Oh, and God, I get it. And they were the trying to guess now. your bank account and they were just, yep. why don't you put your money in this? And you're movies. just like, no, I'm, I'm here. Restaurants. Yeah, movies. Like, I'm here. I'm here. So I'm here. 
I, if, if a company that, um, asked me to, you know, I got the deal flow and it was by a white man and, and he did really well. I would just be like, great. You know, you got a coupon code for it. Like, I'd love to check it out. You know, you and your yacht and on your billions, I'm happy for you. That's not the game I'm in. I don't want to win that game. What was it like meeting with the big LPs? I know you met with some of the big LPs out there. I've met with them over the last couple of years because they all come knocking because they're fascinated by me. Uh, but they're fascinated, I feel, like in somebody like me and a very cautious kind of like, isn't that an interesting sideshow over there? We need right. to know what he's doing because he hit all these home runs. But you know, those big LPs, they still haven't wanted to, I'm on my third fund, they still haven't wanted to write me the big checks either. Cause what I'm do they not, say? Like, what is the, I mean, what's the pushback there? Single GP is one. Oh, please. <laughs> exactly. Oh, please. I agree. Uh, That's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. It's like, you know, like Kevin Durant puts the ball in the basket and like, is the MVP? Like, you could put four players I mean, around. that is ridiculous. That's it's just so a ridiculous. straight up excuse. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> so but I funny. can still raise tens of millions without them. So, but the other thing is yeah. I told them like this time around, I was like, listen, guys. Uh, and I say guys for a reason because I think yeah, I was yeah. like 20. Fair, it was like enough. two women um, at these big ones, uh, big LPs. I said, listen, uh, I'm not going to, I probably am not going to come around for the fourth fund because I really don't need you guys anymore. And this syndicate thing is getting so big that I can come beg you for a $10 million check every two years and you guys make me jump through hoops or I can write 10 emails about the companies I'm passionate in and have a million dollars come in or do 20 emails and 500K come in. And those people actually, those LPs really appreciate the deal flow and that I'm including them. And you guys are making me fly to Boston and New York and everywhere across the, the Northeast corridor to try to get this old money. And I got to put a suit on and then I pitch you and then you ask me these, let's be candid, like questions that don't matter in a lot of cases. And we go through this whole formality and then you're like, yeah, maybe like in your fourth or fifth fund. And it's what I like about the syndicates, I love about you doing it, is I think you're going to be very dangerous because by the time they want to give you the $10, $20 million check for your fund, you're going to be like, yeah, don't need it. Bye. Which mm. is kind of the point I'm at now where I'm like, I, I'm not coming to your big endowment office again and doing my tap dancing for you and jumping through hoops and answering questions like, tell me about these three companies that went to zero. It's like 80% well, who cares? Eighty yes. went to zero. Like, what are we talking about here? So what was it like for you to go to those rooms? Did you feel like they were um, pandering to you or just? It's, it's like you just described for yourself. And then to, on top of that, imagine that they ripped your clothes off and, and looked at every piece of your body and said where you were fat. Oh, fuck. <laughs> you know what i'm saying like it is you you even your description was triggering it's triggering right it's, it's like, triggering because that happens that happens that's what it is and i don't understand so explain to me this you have like a unicorn every year basically or like an average of one a year that since the first one correct every how, 18 months, how yeah. can they justify that their job is to make money for their client right so how can they these fund of funds etc how can they justify Fe uh, but basically what it is, is venture is 5% or 10% yeah, of their mix. Yeah, and they want to be in these legacy funds. They got all these legacy funds. The legacy funds keep coming back to them. They don't like to add new managers because that's work. And you know, when you try something new, if it doesn't work, you did something new and it failed. Whereas if you, do so if you do the 10th you know, vintage of a fund that's existed since 1970, 80, 90, whatever, and you were in the last six or 12 and it fails, well, who cares? They had that fund that's that right. Google was in or Apple was in or Atari was in. They already hit the home run for you. So you kind of forgive them, but they don't want to take a chance on the new. And then like, again, uh, you know, I have that experience, you know. But why would you want that? Is it because you want to be able to like go into an another round and have like five, $10 million checks to do? Uh, it's a good question, Arlen. You know, like I did it originally because my mentors were like, hey, this person wants to meet you, or hey, uh, you should meet these people. So people in my circle, want, who my mentors are, you know, wanted to help out their LPs and help me out, right? Because that's how Silicon Valley is. Um, yeah. The favors might not be equally distributed to everybody, uh, but it is a favor bank of a place. And you mm -hmm. experience that because you had some people like Sokka, whoever, 
who helped you out, Sam Altman helped you out. Yeah, I have a, I have an entire chapter in my book about um, not being self-made, for sure. Right. And so, you know, people will help each other here. So I was doing part of that. And I think to a certain extent, I was like, well, this is how it's done. And there was that. And then if I'm totally honest with myself, I think as somebody who couldn't get into Harvard or who couldn't get into those places, maybe in the back of my mind, I was like, well, if I get uh, Harvard's endowment or, you know, whatever Ivy League endowment to back me, then I will have arrived. Then I will be. Yeah, yeah, Then yeah. it will be legit. And then I realized, like, wait a second, I already made my money. I yeah. Actually, and I started watching, you know, it was my inspiration was I watched Axe Capital on Billions. And okay, I, was like, I, I don't watch it. You should watch it. I don't it's, watch it. I get, I get scared to watch those types of things. I think I'm going to be mad. <laughs> <laughs> no, you would actually like it because okay. there's um, a non-binary person in it. I know. I am and, aware. Yeah. And she's awesome. They they are awesome. They are awesome. They are awesome. Uh, and there's just a lot of like, it's not our version of investing, but there's a lot of the kind of dynamics and shadows of it. But there's just a point at which Axe is like, you know what? I'm using my own capital. I'm going on a heater. I'm not wearing a suit. I'm going to go in with my ACDC t-shirt and jeans. I'm going to tell people, this is your opportunity. You're in, you're out. And boom, and that's the way I'm approaching it now. You're in, you're out. Here's the deadline. Here's the paperwork. Got any questions? Happy to have lunch. Happy to run you through the deck if you want. But you're in, you're out. Totally cool. If you got other opportunities that are better than this one, Mazel Tov, do it. Um, and I, I was just like, I don't need anybody. I got here, you know. Uh, through a series of some, you know, lucky events, of course, and some hard work. And I, I'm just, I don't feel the need to get their money. If I were you, I mean, I know you just said it and I hope you believe it because if I were you, if I had six or seven unicorns yeah, and I was still in my, what, what are you? 49. What, how old are you? 49. Still in my 40s? Yeah. Or my 50s? Yeah. I had se six or seven unicorns. That I know, I it's a sold, career. It's a career. Like for, they would have to, I mean, <clears throat> the fact that you don't use a curse word in every sentence and tell them that, you know, <laughs> it's don't like a gift. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you don't need them. And also it's like life is more fun without, without worrying about what, with these, like you call, call that's suits, what I realized what the last time around, because I did it and I thought, you know what? The first time I went around my second fund, I was like, okay, I, my expectation is zero. But then I was like, you know, third fund, I met with them before. They told me like, yeah, we'd like to get to know you over a couple of funds. Yeah. Okay, well, here we are. It's a couple. And hey, by the way, I, last time I had two unicorns, now I got six or seven. Like, hey, let's talk. And I do this whole tour and like, you know. It's Adam, an insult. I was just like, come on. I understand though. I understand that whole thing of like, you know, after um, I had some weird press last year about my fund, I was like, Man, I'm gonna get. You're gonna see a 360 million. You can't. You can't see a three, 36 million. You're gonna see a 360 million tech. You know, headline. So I think I feel like you're looking for like that tech crunch. I told you so. Headline. <laughs> that like f you guys. But it, but deep down, you really wouldn't care about that money. No. You just you just need that little bit. So what I would do is like repurpose that because you have all these you have all these tools at your disposal and you're you're something about your you know your nose can find these deals and it's about the process. And I think it's about like the same thing we do where we talk to a lot of companies. Talk to a lot, make a lot of small bets, 10 X on the winners. I mean, what we do in the early stage is incredibly simple. If you just pick great founders who have delighted customers and have some modest amount of traction, just a modest five customers, a thousand people using free, whatever it is, at least you have a customer to talk to you make that small bet, 25, 50K, then you make that 250 bet, then you make that million dollar bet. If you just do that, that playbook is so simple that people overthink it. And that, that's what I try to tell people is don't, don't try to like figure it out too much because you'll yeah. talk yourself out of it. Like it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but you know, I, I, I think the world's changing because of these syndicates. You had a, a, a quick call with, um, one of your investments, it's a trucking company. Um, the name, what's the name of it again? Fleeting. 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 It's such a great name. How did I forget it? Um, but I, it was, you know what it was? It was like, I was like 1 a.m. death scrolling and listening to your pod, <laughs> doom scrolling, the end of the world. And it was a really interesting. Tell us about that company. Tell us when you invested. Um, and then tell us what's happening. It was either Republic or Seed Invest they were on. It's the Republic. They're on Republic Republic Co right now. Don't know how long they'll be there because they're almost reaching their million dollar seventy um, limit. 
So that, like, if you had joined the, uh, if anybody joins the backstagecrowd.com syndicate that we have, we have an accredited lane and, and a non-accredited lane. This would have been in the non-accredited lane because it's open on someone else's platform for a non-accredited deal. So $100 is the minimum. This is a company I met, Pierre, in 2018, I believe, maybe two, two and a half years ago. And uh, I met him at a, at a fireside, actually. He, he had a question. He answer, asked a question. And I, I, the best way I can say this is Do that- Do you remember the question? I don't. He was just asking about, he had had some predatory um, uh, web design. Uh. And they had kind of taken advantage of him and-, and um, and he was wondering, wondering about a couple of things there. But what, what I noticed, what I realized was like, man, you know what? I hate it, but he probably wouldn't, he wouldn't be taken as seriously as he should be in other rooms. And that pissed me off, you know? Like I was like, I know that he wouldn't be, t- but I know he knows what he's talking about. And I could tell, so I talked to him afterwards and he knew what he was talking about. And he had been a trucker himself. He had done all these things. And you learn later that he, he was, uh, he wanted to be a doctor and all these things happen. Anyway, he is, is perfect, perfectly fit for this, for this, uh, type of company. They just help match truck, truckers with trucking companies. It's, yep. it's like a, you know, they, they recruiting. Help. Yeah. Finding truckers because they have massive turnover. Yeah, and also like helping them with the with um with scheduling to make the turnover not so bad. And uh when I met him, it was on, it was like an idea and it was like kind of a new start because they just had a rough time with a, with an old uh developer. And now they they're uh I can't remember exact numbers, but they're more than a million dollars in and 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 revenue um and um and thousands and thousands of matches hmm. and people's lives have changed. And you invested two or three years ago? Yeah. So a nice little up round for you. Yeah, you definitely. Especially I mean, there's there's always something happening in the background, right? So it's 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 gonna be it's a beautiful little story here. And it's also like my brother and my mom made their first investments this month because Aww. they invested in fleeting. Nice. On on the, the platform. Well, you like me, like I think we index for people with grit. And what I loved about the fleeting founder's story, and he's on republic.co, which is a great crowdfunding site, by the way. The two fa- crowdfunding sites, uh, equity crowdfunding, where non-accredited investors, 96% of the country can invest. Uh, that I, The only two I recommend, uh, Seed Invest and Republic. I have deep relationship with them. I've had many of my companies go through both of those. I think those are the number I think probably tied for number one. Um, I think Republic's newer, but they're both pretty great. Um, people get great outcomes. But he had to drop out of school to become a trucker. And then he started making 90 grand a year and he felt bad about himself. And then like his yep. advisor was like, um, you realize people are graduating and they're getting $40,000 a year jobs. You're making more than double what everybody else is making. Like, yeah. don't ever be ashamed of hustling to get where you are. Um, and I think that, Grit and hustle is just such an obvious indicator of venture worthiness, of investor investing worthiness, right? Yeah, and if people do overthink it, and and it's it's insulting because, like you said, eight out of ten companies are going to fail anyway. So if you're doing it right, yeah. So if you're that's you know, there's a whole thing there. But if you if you're throwing up all these excuses of why someone like Pierre, someone like all of these other founders that are just going to make me so incredibly wealthy that I can't stand it. Um, <laughs> like if you're, if, you know, if there's a way to find any, any old excuse for them. You'd really, it's really have to like think about a bias that you may have, you know? So it's, it's great to, to have these, these conversations with the founders and the more syndicate deals we do, the, the more, like if we can go from writing a 50 K check to writing a 500 K check overnight, huge. it's huge. You'll get there. It's huge. Because if you think about it, like, I could go out and try to raise a hundred million dollar fund, which I have. It's it's impossible. If I can go out and try to do that, but what am I going to do? I'm going to deploy it over about five years. It's going to be two thirds of it will be follow on. I'm going to write two fifty k to a million dollar checks at the first at, at first, and then follow on greatly there. I could do that exact same model with the syndicate hmm. and having a, a really good relationship with downstream investors. And- one of the things I like about the syndicate as well as a format, and I think it's really going to be disruptive to LPs because folks like us who really represent the future of the industry in terms of, you know, fund managers, because we're getting in early, which means we have a disproportionate amount of influence on what happens later, is once you do not need those big funds anymore, 
um, and you have this great relationship with a group of people, it's more fun to do it with the syndicate members. It's a lot more fun oh, because they love is. to be involved, right? They yes, love to write a 4K so check. Um, and you get to bond with them and uh, they are they turn out to be super helpful. Whereas like some giant LP is not going to help your company, you know, get a meeting at Disney, right? Which we had one of our companies got like seven introductions to people at Disney by emailing the people who had invested, right? That's where the syndicate can be really helpful. That's what I'm working on for my 2.0 of the syndicate is knowing the syndicate members' uh, skill sets and knowing yeah. them better and trying to bucket them and say like, okay, these people are sales, these people are tech, these people are whatever, product, you know. And they, and it's they like, can. I don't think anything could have been more tailor-made for us in this moment than syndicates. I really don't. Well, and it also, what I like about it too is it keeps you super honest where you and I might be frisky and like make some like crazy bets because we have that nature. When, you, when I do a syndicate, I only put up the stuff that I feel has like real revenue, consistency, and I, I try to like protect the downside a bit. Yeah. Which means like some wild stuff may not get in there, some really crazy stuff. Um, but I've been trying to reduce the like, we invested in six months later, it went away to like, mm. at least you got a year or 18 months of runway out of this. And so to clear, um, that's something AngelList added too, was like the funding has to last 12 months. So at least you have some chance. You don't want to be like catching the knife in, in all these things. Um, so everybody should sign up for Backstage Crowd, by the way, dot com right now. Um, and you're going to try to do a deal a month, 12 deals, you said. Eventually, maybe go to That's two That's what we're going to experiment with. We're going to be very open to it because our deal flow is so robust and we have really great, interesting terms that we can put together. It will depend on the appetite of the of the syndicate. Right. So if we can do two a month, we'll do two a month. We just won't go crazy and do anything for vanity. We'll just do what's really organic. Yeah. Hi, the quality is the key because you know what I did was I shared with the top 10% of our syndicate the you know last update on metrics we have. And that was a little bit scary. Like here's all 130 deals. Here's all yeah. 40 or 50 million we deployed. And here's the outcome. And, you know, the out of the first 50 deals, you see a lot of red. You see a lot yep. of shut down companies. And somebody was like, oh, my God, this is so depressing. And they had invested in both rounds of calm. I was like, so you're up 10x cash on cash or whatever it was. Yeah. But this is depressing for you? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, okay, I told you this in my book. And you yeah. know this, don't you? And they're like, yes, I know it. But it still makes me feel bad. I'm like, okay, you have to get through 25 losses to have the five that win actually mean something. If they all won, that would be called publicly traded companies already. Like this is high risk investing. There'll be Netflix or Uber in 10 years, not now. And then one person was like, I did your first, I did eight of your first 11 deals, but I didn't do calm and density. And so I literally picked the anti-portfolio. And I was like, yeah, that's bad luck. But <laughs> mm. I was like, was there a thesis there? He's like, not really. I <laughs> just didn't like them. I was like, okay. Somebody's like, oh, you're just a bad picker. I was like, no, I don't think it's that. I think you, you know, you just have to understand the power law is you got to hit 30, 40, 50 investments. So make small investments. You're also doing a course now, I yeah. see. So tell everybody about that. I have an online course. It's called How to Raise Capital uh, for Your Startup from Scratch or for anything from scratch. It really is, though, a Trojan horse to bootstrapping, uh, mostly. Because I, I do teach you how to raise capital. I've raised millions of dollars myself. I've generated millions in revenue. I've invested in 130 companies and seen more than 6,000 all in five years. So I have some insights into these things so I can help there. Uh, but I also know that 80% uh, or so of the companies that I meet could do without any sort of outside funding, including Angel, and could bootstrap their way. And, and, and you want to have the, the, the investors chasing you and not the other way around. So I, I do a, a mixture in that. So you go to itsaboutdamntime.com and click on Arlen's Academy and it'll take you right there. It's where you can also pick up the book. Uh, yeah, everybody buy the book. It's uh, About Damn Time. And uh, get the audio book is my best advice uh, because Arlen reads it and she's got a very soothing voice. Her uh, podcast is uh, Your First Million and that's very good as well. And the syndicate is Backstage Crowd. Uh, as we wrap up here, I know you got to go and I appreciate your time during quarantine uh, to carve out an hour for us. When we look at race relations, when you look back at your five years, one way of looking at how hard it was for you is man, the tech industry is totally fucked up and crazy that, you know, it's so hard for somebody to break in. A charitable way to look at it was, 
Oh, my Lord, she broke in. She got meetings with all these people. So how do you reconcile your amazing success with hard work uh, and the industry, which is an, you know kind of like a, a nebulous word, but the industry, has our industry in the five years that you struggled through it to get where you are, do you see meaningful change that makes you hopeful for the future? I see it on the horizon. I think that the first four or so years, no. <laughs> and it was very true, and it's, it's, it still needs a lot of work. I see it on the horizon, maybe not be from the inside, but from, from the people who have been oppressed just making it so and, and making it undeniable. Um, and the way that I kind of say that, you say that I, I did break in, that is a charitable way of saying it. But think about it. I put, I am not, um, I'm an outlier. And I have a way of thinking that most people don't have. And I have a, 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 a resi like a, a way of doing things that most people don't have and shouldn't in most, in most cases. Um, this is like a, this is insanity what I've done. It's insanity work. Right. right? This shouldn't have to be this hard to get this far. So that's where I sit. So I did break in, but I was, woo, I tell you what. If we all had to do what I had to do, it wouldn't yeah. be worth it. Not sustainable, not worth it, sleeping 100%. in the airport. So the lesson is, even though I threaded the needle, that doesn't mean that the problem is solved. Don't yeah. look at my success and say, <laughs> mission accomplished, because yeah. the mission hasn't been accomplished, right? And we we even see it with successful founders. Um, uh, was it Angela Benton who did the tweet storm recently about... She had a bad experience with Cowboy Ventures, and it was just that they. Oh, were, really? No, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, she tweeted about it, and she was just like, you know, the I went to the first meeting, it was great. The second meeting, like, uh, uh I guess it was Ted Wang was the person she was talking about, and you know, he was kind of like, oh yeah, next slide, next slide. I get it, I get it, I get it. It was kind of dismissive, mm -hmm. right? So it wasn't the, uh, you know, we're not investing in this kind of thing. It was more like a little bit of a subtle. She felt bias. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily say racism. There's a bias, there's a prejudice. Those are all bad things too. Yeah. And so it's like this bias and she j also respect, right? Which I think is like a very interesting word because there's like outright racism, there's bias. And there's just like being respectful during a meeting with the founder and like using your brain. Like if you've dedicated the 30 minutes, like just give them the 20 minutes to talk and then ask a couple questions, you're good. You don't have to rush them through the deck and, you know. Um, she didn't wind up feeling very good about it. But that's good that you feel like we've made progress, but still a ways to go and the change will be from outside. Yeah, I think there's there's more work to do, 100% more work to do. <laughs> we are we are just getting started. But if I didn't feel hopeful, I wouldn't be able to do, wake up every morning and work on this. There's just no way. Yeah. And on that note, I'll just say, it's good to know you, Arlen. It's good to know your story and to watch you do it. Um, and it's good to know you're waking up every day doing the hard work for the founders who need you, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, you have my respect and uh, my support. Uh, you know that. Um, and uh, can't wait to share some deal flow as well. Yeah. As you get going. You Everybody, you hear my voice. Stop what you're doing. I want you to do three things. Number one, you go to Backstage Crowd, you sign up. Credit or not. Number two, you buy the goddamn book, you cheapskates. Buy the book right now. She couldn't go on book tour because of Corona, unfortunately. Uh, but when you do your book tour, let me know if you need a, an interviewer or something like that. I'm happy to help. Uh, awesome. I'll have some tips for you too on that, uh, on the book tour. I'll give it to you though privately. Okay. Um, so that's number two, buy the book. Uh, number three, sign up for the podcast where, you know, sometimes on a Sunday night, she may drop something raw and entertaining. Uh, your first million is the name of the podcast. Arlen is uh, Arlen was here, and she's still here. I can tell you based on my experience, she ain't going anywhere. We'll see you next time on this week in startups. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs>